Afternoon, everyone. Afternoon, everyone. It's working. Welcome, everyone. Um, really pleased to see you all here. Uh, just a little about what our focus is for today. Um, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about some of the leadership challenges ahead um, for us as the officer team. Um, we're going to talk. We've got really pleased uh, that we have Tony Travers uh, with us. I'm going to introduce him a bit later. that we've done on 2030 vision. Does that look like Asia? Shall I come over here? Maybe it's, I need to be closer to the center. No? I'll just shout. <laughs> um, so our own work that we've been doing on 2030 vision, and Simon's going to talk about that. We've got a table discussion, and then Ali Mamana is going to talk about the work we've been doing around keeping our people promised for the city council. Just in terms of uh, leadership at the moment, so for those of you who haven't been to the session, I mean, we have um, some of the leaders of the political groups here. We've got Councillor Dan Yates, leader of the council, Councillor Tony January of services. The leadership network is the top 100 managers and uh, in the organisation, and you are the people that lead us the politicians. If we don't work as a corporate group, we will not be able to deliver for our political well periods that we're living in, working through, really is uh, quite unprecedented in terms of the things that are happening that are affecting our lives at national and local level. I think Tony probably will talk a little bit about that. Uh, and the role that um, political leadership in localities, the work of our council to be able to help lead the community through some very challenging times is probably more significant now than it's ever been, certainly in my uh, lifetime. Um, we know that there are lots of challenges for us, um, that those uh, have always been with council leadership, but it's particularly difficult at the moment. And we also know, sometimes because of the finances, sometimes because of the changing expectations of our community, that we're constantly having to modernise and change what we do. So at the beginning, um, we as a management team working across the organisation, we, we manage something like 4,500 Just in terms of how we're work, getting these meetings to work, um, uh, one of the good things I think is that we took your feedback and one of the things that you said you liked was having good, uh, relevant speakers and we listened to you, so um, with no further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce Tony Travers. Tony doesn't really need a huge amount of introduction for, for those of you who follow national politics and the local government world, you will often see Tony popping up in, on, on the screen. Um, he's, um, I, I've worked with Tony many times in the past before. I think the first time we worked together was uh, on Wembley Stadium, as I recall, uh, in a rather um, dodgy hotel somewhere out in the countryside where you came along and spoke to the political leaders then about understanding the landscape. So I'm delighted that Tony's with us and uh, look forward to hearing from Tony. Great. Thank you. Okay, well let's just try, can you, <clears throat> can you hear me at the back if I don't use this? Yeah? All right, let's try without, because it's easier than, I, I, I can think more clearly and not hold in the microphone. If you can't hear it any more, let me know. Uh, first, thank you very much, Mr. Jeff, for inviting me this afternoon. I'm going to rattle through a number of slides on some sort of...
years in the United Kingdom. Uh, you know, the 2008 banking crisis, all the fallout from that has uh, continued really ever since. Uh, Scottish referendum, general election, EU referendum, second general election, what's going on today, heaven knows what's going on as we speak uh, in Parliament. So it's interesting politically. So, this is what's happened to the local government of Stonehenge in the period since 2009-10. These are uh, Institute of Political Studies and highly uh, sought after kind of statistics. You see the flat line there shows that local government of Stonehenge dropped by about 20, 25% on average in real terms. An unprecedented change. Some individual authorities spending has fallen further. Uh, if you look at adult social care, that's the sort of rather ominous green colour, that <coughs> sort of went down and then started to go up again. You see there that the government decided to allow extra money through the Better Care Fund and extra money from uh, so called Precept, pushed that up. But then, of course, if you take the uh, sort of ominous green line out of the darker sort of grey line, you see what's spending, what's happened to spending on anything other than, uh, than uh, adult social care, which of course includes children's social care, which itself has been protected. So, uh, an incredible amount of pressure on some local government services. And if you look at what's happened to local government, here the line is showing employment across the whole of local government in England. The, again, slightly ominous orange, uh, sort of green line is local government employment. That's going back to September 1999, rising up to about 9, 10, then falling, but national government, which includes the NHS of course, but national government employment has continued to increase. And so, uh, in many ways, and I'm not making a political point here, simply to say that national government is not the first time this has happened, has required local governments to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to holding down public spending in order to shrink the deficit, whereas its own services have, not in every case, but broadly, and overall, being protected. And of course this has led to what the Institute for Government and other respected think tank has observed that uh, not only for local government, but national government has cut some services to the point that they have required a cash injection. So uh, prison service cut a lot, then eventually trouble, the government had to put money in, adult social care, similar, the NHS arguably uh, potholes and rents actually. Uh, so this is a new way of dealing with public spending, which is in a sense you squeeze services until one of them fails or several of them fail, then you throw money at them. It's a, it's a, it's a new way of trying to um, manage public spending. However, public uh, perceptions, um, the public satisfaction with local government services. This is shown here, a local government association um, survey done up to June 2016, like in June 2016, uh, and actually comparing it to the four years before, shows that public satisfaction with services is amazingly constant. It may have gone down fractionally, but compared to the change in spending, satisfaction has been sustained. And I find this amazing. There's two possible explanations, or maybe a number of possible explanations. One is that because of the great wall of comments about how bad it was going to be for local government, most people found that most services continued to exist, and therefore they thought, oh, much better than I thought. So against expectations, things have turned out better. Most people's libraries stayed open, in fact. That's one thing. The other is, of course, and it's an and or potentially, local government has become much more efficient and productive. So whilst cutting spending is not normally seen as the best management tool for improving productivity and efficiency, but it definitely makes people within local governments, with any public service, think harder about the way the service is delivered. So I think there's a certain amount of that in there. So really quite an amazing the problem with this, of course, is that if the Treasury sees these figures, it's put these two, all these figures added together, they say, oh well, local governments manage spending. So why did we go a little bit further? You know, why did we try it a bit harder? And the you know, other parts of the public sector which are less able to deal with it, you know, get past that. That's another thing. And this is another 
Uh, from the same poll, we've all done you know, national opinion polls in the usual kind of uh, big sample. What you find here is that your local council, we have to give all of these numbers, uh, is viewed more positively than local councils more generally, and surprise, surprise, significantly more popularly than the government. So you want to take one encouraging thought away with you today. People like councils more than they like the government. They like councillors more than they like MPs. They like individual MPs more than they like MPs as a group. And so on and so on. So actually, despite all the negative press that local government doesn't get, the public quite likes it. And they like councillors even. Uh, so, you know, something to uh, feel positive about. The other thing to show is this. This is an international comparison done by Ipsos Mori, a big international polling company, looking at uh, public satisfaction with public services. And actually, despite big changes to the public sector since 2009-10, in terms of public satisfaction across a range of countries that they've looked at here, the UK is right in the middle of the pack. So, look, yeah, given the big changes that's gone on in the public sector, particularly local government in this period, local government has remained uh, surprisingly uh, seen as
come in, was originally required to do, but didn't become used to contracting in terms of that, and they came from privatising things. Public private partnerships and private financial initiatives were very, very popular under Gordon Brown as Chancellor. It started under Conservatives. Labour did a lot of it. The present government's doing rather less of it. But the idea that somehow uh, schools and other facilities were derived to provided by the private sector, which designed them, built them, and then operated them, and then the public sector paid the management fee. This would be more effective, more efficient. Recent evidence from the National Audit Office suggests that in the end, the cost of borrowing the money for the private sector was so much higher than the public sector doing it, that the savings may have been less than was originally expected. But that's another thing that was, uh, for a while, popular, less so now. You use audit. You can the audit commission no longer, but the National Audit Office still looks at local government as a whole. We have a whole load of regulations bearing down on local government services and other services, and under Eric Pickles at least, I'm not sure this got very far, but that's in armchair auditors. And then of course, last but not least, the thing that local governments had to cope with more than anything, the point I made earlier, is simply reducing expenditure. So if you cut spending for a service, one way or another, the managers inside it have to cope. Have to try to do more with less, and actually, local government have been, so they say, surprisingly good at this. In the longer term, this is real, you know, this is futurology stuff. People inside central government will occasionally, if they dare, have this kind of conversation. I'm not sure they do dare quite as much as they should. I mean, we can't go on like this. I'm not getting into uh, this in elaborate detail today, but in a sense, you can't cut local government. Uh, capital investment, the police, um, home office services, they've been puzzled off actually, and other things. Uh, forever. Defence, even defence, which was quite a thing puzzled along the way. Come on, cutting that for all time. Because eventually, the NHS and education and the welfare budget, which are all growing all the time in real terms, would consume the whole of public spending. And that mathematically cannot happen. So at some point, this kind of choice is going to have to be made. So, you know, this is a real sort of political, you know, choice to make a choice. Significant longer term commitment to raise taxation. That would be one way to do it. That would, you know, perhaps it wouldn't just be from the rich. You can't get enough money from the rich. There aren't enough money. There aren't the rich to get the money from. You'd have to raise money from a broad range of taxpayers. And very few people in the major political parties, I'm not saying anything we didn't do here today, thinks that's politically particularly attractive. Most political parties have been trying to take lower rate taxpayers out of taxation for some time now. But if you're going to raise a lot of money from, say, income tax, you have to raise it from a larger number of people. Uh, and then, of course, you could try refencing taxes for a particular purpose. There's been a lot of discussion about this ring fencing, say, national insurance for the National Health Service. The problem with that is it doesn't kind of get around the long term problem, the so called graph of doom problem that uh, Barnett, uh, Barnett's director of finance, came up with uh, some years ago, uh, which is in the end, if uh, you construct and control overall public, public expenditure, total managed expenditure, and continue to allow the NHS and other services to grow, as I said, eventually there isn't enough, enough money for defence, local government, police, and everything else. So it doesn't quite get around that problem. And of course, even if you did have a ring fence national insurance fund to pay for the NHS, in a recession, the national insurance fund money can fall. So you'd still have to top it up. So it doesn't get around that problem either. So I personally am not convinced, but that's just my personal view. An alternative proposition would be to say, well, we don't, we're not going to do it that way, we're going to do it the other way. We're going to say the state should do less and change priorities. Now, that would mean to reduce the services provided by government, and I don't just mean local government, not just the same, cutting the same small ones again and again, cutting libraries and refuse collection. You can't, in the end, libraries and refuse collection are a tiny proportion of total expenditure, even though refuse collection probably along the street sweeping is the single service by which most people judge the whole of government. You know, most people do not recognise, they're not, not aware of trident, but they are aware of whether the street, street, uh, street is clean outside their home. So, <coughs> I think this is what the government started to do. You know, back 
in the 19th century. Um, you know, the triple lock on pensions only preserved in place by the current government's need to have a non-binding arrangement with an arrangement with the democratic unionists in the current government. I'm not making a political point, it's just a statement of fact. The Conservatives left on their own devices, like Labour, have probably got rid of the triple lock on pensions, actually. So it's a, a, an artifact of the last general election result that the triple lock on pensions are still with us. But you only have to say that. Best of luck with the government really pushing through getting rid of the triple lock on pensions. Pensions vote at scale. Um, and you know, so there's a big challenge there. Could the state really do less? Third possibility, which is even more controversial than the first two, really, is co payments for services. Now, we do pay some public services with co payments university fees, all the great new universities, all these new buildings they're all putting up. That's because of fees. They now have a guaranteed. £9,000 for undergraduates, more than that for postgraduates, which has led to all that expansion. Railways, you know, came here on the train today, miraculously it worked. Um, <laughs> cheap joke out of railways, but still. Um, you know, it did work. It hard but we pay for our train, government puts in some money, capital investment, but we pay for fares, quite big fares, we think that's normal, maybe they're too high, and social housing even restrictions within the NHS, and ophthalmology, and dentistry. So there are lots of examples of government doing things where we pay money and we pay charges we think it's normal. <coughs> we could extend this a long way, but again, we only have to say, well, well then, we actually need to test some services, it's even more controversial. We only have to sort of suggest, well, perhaps we should charge people to go to the GP just to see the wall of opposition that produces. So, again, none of these are easy. And of course, Brexit, but I'm not making a, not a big Brexit day today, I'm not going to talk about it more than twice. Even if Brexit makes things better in the medium to long term, I'm not going to comment on whether it does or not. If in the short term, trend growth is lower, and I think there's a possibility that might be the case, then it makes the Chancellor's challenge of making the books add up just that bit more difficult, even if in the long term, the economy grew faster. So that's a sort of a tiny, we have a spending review, which we have at least every four years, or at least for four years ahead, a new one, uh, which will be uh, at work we'll start on this uh, very soon, running into the autumn. Already the government's announced £20 billion pounds for the NHS, up to 2023, 20, 23, 24, that's in real terms. But of course, in the best traditions of government, the extra spending has been announced, but not how it's going to be paid for. That tells you a lot about the way in which government has to think. You know, they can announce the spending increase, but not uh, yet how it can be paid for. Poor Philip Hammond's got to do that in the uh, autumn budget, uh, which will be a much harder thing to sell, I think. Defence is pushing for additional resources, and we'll almost certainly get them. Adult social care is awaiting government's bigger reform package, which has been waiting in terms of this government for a long time. Previous government didn't do that either. But there's no, as with the NHS, unlike, unlike the NHS, where the government has committed additional resources for the future, there's no commitment as to not only the amount of money, but how, how what systems to work in the future. Lots of ideas out there how adult social care might be, particularly care for older people in care homes might be funded, but we don't know yet any of the details of that. So unless the government decides to push up spending and or the deficit, Local governments will, at best, be left with something close to a flat cash settlement for the next spending review period, as far as I can see. That is, no extra resources and possibly a cut in real terms for the next three or four years. Now we'll see. Some areas of the pilots for business rate retention are being given a rather better position than this, and the argument for having uh, such a pilot are quite, quite significant. The other thing to say is that there's been a so-called fair funding review, Sajid Jamin when he was um, housing and community secretary, big on this, we haven't heard so much from the new secretary of state, but this is a review of the way the distribution of resources between councils functions. The difficulty is though, against the fact that there being no more money, that if you're to redistribute money at all from one council, one set of councils to another, then it simply means taking money off some and giving it to others. 
back against the backdrop of six, seven, eight years of reduced spending for most councils. So I think the scope for the major redistribution of money is limited, but the county councils in particular are very, very <coughs> pushing very hard to get more money out of this uh, review. This is the public spending share of the whole economy. It's sort of macroeconomic point. At the far end, you've got their uh, country expectancy in a very big state. Uh, Finland, <coughs> in the news yesterday, and France and Denmark. So France, Denmark, they've got a public sector, the public spending is over 55% of the economy. Here it is, the old UK in the year 2015, I think. Here, right in the middle of the table, is about 40 41%. Down here, Blue Ireland, Korea, and somewhere on the way the United States. Now we're moving this way. We're moving this way. We're not going to get right to the end. We're going to settle about 37. So about where the United States is. Now that's you know that's a choice we've made. We taxpayers, we we voters <coughs> empower governments to make these decisions. We can change our views, but that's what we've been signaling to government so far. All I say about that is. If we settle the state that's 37% of GDP, it is a lot smaller than many European countries with which we would normally compare ourselves. That's, as I say, I'm not, that's, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that's what we have suggested by our national politicians over quite a long period that we, that we want. And if we don't have a big state, we'll have to pay higher taxes. Now, just thought I'd look at something slightly different for a few minutes. The scale of the economy in Brighton and Hove. Because uh, we, have, we have data from the Office of National Statistics about the size of the national economy, regional economies, but they're getting better at the local economies that we have. So you can now get local authority by authority gross value added kind of GDP, not quite nearly the same thing. And here we've got the, the highest three in the Wider southeast, so I'm actually including not only the southeast but the east here. And you can see that right now is the second biggest economy. Meet the other teams with the biggest, many very similar in the wider southeast. So it's an important economy. If you look over here, compare it with core cities, so Newcastle, Liverpool, Manchester, really up on the bottom, you can see that the Brighton Home economy is slightly smaller than the Newcastle upon Tyne's economy. So, in a sense, the Brighton economy and hope economy is not unlike that of a number of bigger core cities elsewhere in the uh, country. And if you look at other rapidly growing towns and cities and some London boroughs which are growing, and you can aggregate according to some degree, uh, very similar, slightly bigger economy than you know, Cambridge or Oxford, same kind of size as Hackney or Croydon. So, just to put it in context, the Brighton Hope economy is a substantial one and important, therefore, to the wider South East as well as to itself. Within the, the South East, public spending is relatively low. These are official data, they're government numbers for public spending per head. So you can see there that the England figure is 8816, compared with that, London is. Um, 10, 1, 2, 9, highest uh, in England, though not as high as Scotland or Northern Ireland, and uh, the South East is 7977, so it's actually below the England average. And when you consider the costs are higher in the South East, that tells you something about the relative lack of public or the relative underspend compared with other parts of the country. Now, you might think, well, the South East is a rich place. It needs less public spending, <coughs> less spend on welfare and welfare and benefits, and so all these reasonable points. Over here, I've just put uh, in a similar kind of table, adding London and the South East and the East together. And in some ways, the uh, London and the South East and the East are more like the North West or the South West, which is more of an urban rural area. And then you see that actually the wider London region has public spending slightly below the national average. And that's uh, due to this fascinating, to me anyway, chart, which is looking at, remember that on an earlier chart, I was saying that public spending in the United Kingdom is around 41% of GDP. I was looking at it a moment ago 
uh, compared with other countries. Well, this is comparing the United Kingdom, the top bar, with the regions and the rest of the regions and nations in the rest of the UK. What we find is that London and the South East have um, relatively small public spending as a share of their economy. Now, they have bigger economies. The, power, the real difference between London and the South East and the rest of the UK is not the level of its public spending, it's the level of its private sector. That's the big difference. The private sector in London and the South East is vastly bigger relatively than in other parts of the country. But in the London economy, only 29% of it's in the public sector. South East is a little bit bigger, but not much bigger. It's in the sort of you know, mid 30s. So it's about the South East public sector is about the size of the American public sector. When you get to the bottom, and I'm just fascinated by the bottom, Northern Ireland, even before the extra billion pounds, the extra billion is represented by that sort of dark piece at the end of it, nearly 70, well over 75% of the Northern Ireland economy is made up by public spending. That is a remarkable statistic. And you know, what this means, of course, and this is why you know, understanding the way economic development works is so important. You know, if you live in London and the South East, you're going to meet more people who are setting up businesses, who are working in the private sector. But if you're in places where the public sector is this much bigger, most of the best paid jobs will be in the public sector. And there's a very complicated relationship here between the size of the state within a region or nation and um, the impact that has on potential for entrepreneurial activity. You tend to get far higher rates of business startup in London and the South East than other parts of the United Kingdom. And what about the future? Well, population is rising, particularly in London and the South East. London and the South East are the the biggest farms, so the biggest population already, and they're also growing fast. Thus the demand for more housing, the creation of more jobs, and so on. Within the country as a whole, rural areas are growing more slowly and are getting older. Equally and obviously, towns and cities, particularly places like Brighton, Brighton Hove, are um, growing more rapidly and getting younger. Now this has all sorts of implications, uh, some of which are explained in voting patterns, which is very interesting. Um, and, you know, and I said I'd spray a bit into uh, some other stuff. You know, it's by far the changes. The way, we, the, way the way people are living is changing. So people are saying longer in formal education. They are going to need more retraining, later life education. The retirement age is going to get extended one way or another. It has been a bit already. It's going to inevitably to be extended further as more and more and more people live till their 80, then 90, then 100, then 105, and so on. People, I think, there are expectations from different generations that are changing. We, most people above a certain age thought of British politics in terms of left right. Tribal Conservative, Tribal Labour. In 1955 uh, general election, 97.5% of people voted Conservative or Labour. Now it's gone up a bit in the last election, but it's been down as low as 65. But actually, there's also a Conservative progressive spectrum out there of a different thing, a different kind of Conservative. And then separately again, now with the Leave Remain spectrum. Uh, not it really is a spectrum, it's two great big blocks at the moment, but you know, different ways, the, the way we think and vote is somewhat changing. And I think then there's the question of whether attitudes change as people get older, they probably do. We're getting changes to consumerism, more online retail, uh, changing attitudes to different companies, goods and services. People can choose where they live. Academics uh, are now increasingly interested in what they call sorting. The idea that people increasingly choose to go and live in places and with people where they can live, where they have the choice, more like themselves. That creates a kind of sorting within the country like Britain. We got beyond that, we've got uh, ephemeral things like trends and fashion, public mood. But actually, the reason I put them on this slide at all is I didn't think trends, fashion, and public mood, they would dismiss them. 
are actually quite important to the way government has to function. So, you know, older people have a wide and wide big scale of society, which is not true of everybody, but older people have a wide different policies, expectations, and views than London, much than younger. I'm not saying it's better or worse, just there is, if you looked at the last general election of 2017, your age was the most was the most was the strongest predictor of how you vote, more than any other single factor. Behaving by different groups, um, you know, may or may not be set for the rest of their lives. We change our lives more than perhaps in the past, and in a more fragmented and complex society, um, we're perhaps separating into places and within places into neighbourhoods with or interest groups with self-selected needs and expectations. And this, for government, this is a profoundly important issue. Is that having to deal with you know, a population of people, know, that's again it's a bit of a stereotype in the fifties, where most people shared most of their values and might vote one way or the other in the general election. But now people have much more choice in what they think, what they believe. If you're anything like me, I believe in a whole range of completely inconsistent things, nothing that politicians are trying to deal with. Um, and you can do that. And the trouble is for public and private institutions, so private companies as well as public bodies like local government, they have to adapt instantly. <coughs> Get trapped on the wrong side of the social media and change in public mood, and you are toast. We all know that. Uh, the Twitter storm, the felling of individuals in an afternoon, you know, get these things right. Uh, traditional and new media coexist, of course, but if you make a mistake in this new world, there are few second chances. Certainly as an individual, corporations may just about be able to survive individuals apart. And going a bit further into this fun world, so just to, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but companies like Experian, there are others, it's just one of them, you know, looking at key trends in the UK population, but trying to work out what these sort of, what kind of trends can they see out there? And they did come up with some interesting ones, you know, obvious ones like rising renting, more people now rent homes than used to. I mean, a city like that, you know, renting will always, always be somewhat higher than in the southeast as a whole, but renting more generally has been increasing. Uh, segmented cities, cities, you know, divided into widely different neighborhoods, uh, uh, neighborhood types, spreading suburbs, Raging retirement, there's a whole load of these things, we'll ever hear some more. But the point is, people and areas are becoming more differentiated. People can volunteer to move to them and live in them with other people like themselves. And from local government's point of view, you know, they have to think about that, manage it, but also deliver a degree of um, homogeneity, services for all communities brought together all in parallel with this fragmentation. And one final thought on this issue, notwithstanding Brexit or austerity or any of the other things that I've touched on in the last half hour, Deloitte has looked at the likely impact on regional economy of um, move to greater automation and AI and all these other things that are heading towards it. Don't normally believe in this stuff, but this I do. This I do think is going to affect it. And what's intriguing is that they looked at the economies across the country, and the big light blue chunk is occupations with a low probability of automation. And the purple is occupations with a high probability of automation, and the orange, oh, my, my eyesight's not very good, and my color blind. Uh, the, uh, the uh, green colour is a medium probability of automation. What you see is that compared with those on all employment, the southeast of London have a lower probability that this is going to make a big difference, and the further you go this way, the greater the proportional risk uh, to the West Midlands there compared with the southeast or London, a much, much bigger so, uh, risk that automation will radically alter the economy. Why does this matter? Well, of course, you know, the government's involved in trying to rebalance the economy. And the truth is that all of this change will reinforce the north-south imbalance even more. And I'm not 
conventional public policy has yet found a way to do much about this. We'll talk about it. So what have we got coming up? Well, I mentioned the spending review, the fair funding review. Schools funding formula is also in the process of being reformed. The government set a new housing target that's not clear to me with the sequence of housing ministers. There have now been 17 housing ministers since 1997. Uh, whether these targets are going to be delivered or not across the country. And then, of course, you know, we've got Brexit, which I've only talked talk about twice. Perhaps the thing I just say about this is, you know, the thing about Brexit is it will have an effect on the UK economy. It's very hard to predict. The employment growth has continued in London and the South East. But the big question for councils is going to be, however Brexit turns out, what will the local authority and its neighbours do to ensure that the local population is ready, and if the economy changes, what to, what to prepare for it? We haven't quite got there yet, but I think we will at some point next year, it could be suddenly next year, or it might be gradually next year. So, and in fact, you know, this is all being debated on the floor of the House of Commons more as we speak. And then finally, what can we say about Brighton Home and Future Well? The first thing is that local government has proved amazingly <coughs> resilient and inventive. If you look at this, go back to that very first slide, the, 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 the scale of the reductions in local government spending. Had anybody said to me, back in, uh, say, 2009 or 2010. You know, the average local council spending is going to fall by 25% between now and 2018. I just said, it can never happen. Never happen. And yes, it has. We're all sitting here, seeing the satisfaction figures. In the end, it did. Sky didn't fall. And so the degree of resilience and inventiveness is phenomenal, and that will have to continue. We will be a need to keep on changing service, the service offering delivery. Um, I mean, councils where there is economic growth, and this is true here, can benefit from development generating resources like the new home bonus, section 106 money, community infrastructure levy, potential for growth in the business rate. These are all things which, frankly, if you're in an area where there is growth or growth potential, it will create free money that is not available in areas in the Midlands and the North, where often there is much less growth just there. In fact, it's not true everywhere in the Midlands and the North, and it's not true the other way around in the Midlands the South, but as a generality. Then finally, what you know, further innovation can local government imagine to deliver smarter services? Well, one thing that I you know, one or two councils are beginning to look at is you know, data-driven analysis of service cost generated generally. What is it that the council is, the, is the population that the council and other public, public services, is the, service, the, the people that are having services to do, delivered to them, who are the biggest drivers of service, service cost? What could be done to reduce those drivers of cost? Now, the public sector as a whole in Britain, particularly national government, not great at this, but there is clearly scope for looking at where the main drivers of costs are and trying to reduce uh, those drivers by intervention. Public health type interventions, so you have to be wary of the kind of accusations of the nanny state. But even naming off for that, there are things government can do to change behaviour which will make people healthier, which will mean they don't demand so much from the public sector and from public services. <coughs> There may be opportunities for greater use of regulatory powers to drive down costs. An extension of nudge-style behavioural interventions, sort of related to the point I made a second ago, that we know a bit more about behavioural economics and behavioural psychological interventions. You know, there are some things you can do which cost very little, which make people change their behaviour. We need to probably learn more about them. You know, <coughs> A way of saving money, making people behave slightly differently. And then, of course, the last thing we could do is to harness the public, we are the public, um, to monitor neighbourhood needs via apps and all the other things that you know, the internet has created, the possibilities, giving the public eyes and ears. I mean, some people are very good at this without apps, to be honest. But, um, but more generally, you know, what is it that we can harness from the public's understanding of the places it lives in to provide
widely uh, counsel and others with information that makes it not just easier to govern, but to actually deliver services that are more uh, attuned to what people want. So that's it, really. Quick canter through a whole range of uh, issues. Um, and we've got uh, 10 minutes for any questions, thoughts, disagreements, whatever you want. Thank okay, thank you, Tony. So, any any questions people have, thoughts, contributions? If you could say who you are and where you work, that would be helpful. Got one at the back. Hi, uh, my name is Max Woodford. I'm the Assistant Director for City Development and Regeneration. Um, you talked about rebalancing between the north and the south, yep. and that's kind of a lot of the language we're getting around the Shared Prosperity Fund. Have you got any views on where that's going? Have you heard much about that any more than we know? Because we currently feel like we know very little. At all. Well, I mean, I, I mean, given how overloaded central government is, now Whitehall is, by Brexit, you know, there is not, not much else going on inside there at the moment. It's a remarkable phenomenon. Um, so I, I don't think the government itself has come to a, um, you know, we don't know is the answer. However, what I think we do know is that the, the language of rebalancing and trying to um, encourage the economy of the north does mean that southern regions, and I don't just mean London, but the southeast and the east, possibly in parts of the southwest, are probably not going to do as well out of these new funds as they have out of any previous ones. And that is because there is a broader uh, view inside the government that you know, they need to think harder about trying to rekindle or to kindle more strongly the, you know, the Midlands and Northern economies. So the Northern, en the Northern powerhouse, the Midlands engine economies, um, these are the ones that are going to get the attention. So, um, and, you know, so th this is a, um, a bit of a gamble on the part of the government's point of case, uh, I mean, if I'm my view, because um, the truth is that London and the South East produce huge tax revenues that are redistributed effectively to the rest of the country. And the government will have to be jolly sure that if they invest more in other parts of the country and less in the south, that the tax revenue product is the same. Because if it isn't, there'll be less money for everybody. So, but in fairness, you know, the, it's not, this is not the first government that's thought about trying to rebalance the economy, but I think that the, um, you know, that deep down the message of the Brexit referendum has suggested to them they need to try again to try to do something about the parts of the UK that have actually been left quite a long way behind. But so I think it's a long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> carefully disguised. Um, yeah, my question is about whether you think there are any local authorities who are really effective at sort of future proofing. Um, in the way that you described, so whether it's to do with skills or understanding their economies, because I mean, all authorities try and do stuff, but um, I, I'm, I'm always interested when we look, we go out and look for people to copy. When you scratch below the surface, often it's a good PR campaign, and, and they're not actually achieving anything. I mean. I, you, I think your point is well made. I mean, there are there are definitely I, I name no names. There are clearly being councils which. Um, have been very good at getting their message across and sometimes that leads to them getting a lot of government attention. Um, but, you know, in, in, in the absence of any national comparative data about, you know, performance and which councils are doing what, which has transferabil transferability, uh, it's very hard to make that judgment, to be honest, so it's going to be another not very helpful answer, this one I can see. Um, what I would say, however, is that all the evidence of anything, any, any research evidence I've ever seen on this kind of subject is that um, the thing that differentiates, I know this is going to sound so obvious, it's not worth saying, but the thing that differentiates 
authorities that are capable of thinking about the future. Uh, you know, most, most people in most organizations know what needs to be done. If they, need, they can articulate it and get it changed. Um, so the thing that marks out the places that work best tends to be best leadership. I mean, it is, you know, well-run, well-led places are inevitably have greater capacity to think, greater capacity to innovate, and therefore greater likelihood that they will, you know, take risks, some of which won't work, but some of which will work big time. So, uh, so I could, that's not much of an answer either. What I would say was I am personally intrigued by the idea of devoting a little bit of time and effort, a bit of resource within the council to sort of drilling down to look at which parts of, which, which elements of services drive costs most with a view to intervening to try to drive down those costs. Now, I'm sure that's been tried in many places, but the more data we have, the more we can drill down into cost drivers within local government, within government more generally, I think the more likely we are to come up with interventions that cut spending without damaging service levels. That's the one thought I would, you know, from the mother list I put up a few minutes ago. Um, we do know, we have a lot more data now than we used to. It makes it easier to analyze what's driving costs and what, therefore, we might, wherefore we might, where we might intervene to reduce those costs. Is there a hand over here? Yes, go for it. Thank you. Hello, my name's Anna. I'm head of SEN in the Families, Children and Learning. It was something about the health purse, I suppose, and the 20 billion yeah. that's been put in. I suppose, I don't know how, who anybody else felt, but I certainly felt a little pang that we weren't also in receivership of something that was going to help us out, especially when we feel, especially with our social care services, that we are helping the NHS in, in a number of ways. I wondered if you just had a comment about that and that close working relationship and whether the 20 billion is going to be enough. What's a good, well, I mean, where to begin? Um, as others, I mean, the place the National Health Service occupies in British public esteem is uh, remarkable, complex, um, and in the long term, impossible. I mean, the current, you know, the, the fact is that successive governments, for obvious reasons, feel the need to devote more resource to the NHS. But if you look at Mrs. May's recent announcement, about 4% a year, just under 4% a year extra for the NHS for each year up to 2023, then, you know, if you given the economy is going at 1.5% maximum, if you follow the logic of that through, eventually um, the NHS would, would consume the whole of the public sector over the long, 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 long term. And it clearly that mathematically can't happen. So, uh, and local government, the trouble with local government is its services are more popular than the concept of local government. With the NHS, the health service is a service. Local government is government. So, you know, had local government been seen more as care for older people, care for children, and all, it would have got more money. I know this sounds really, really bad, but it's true. And the other thing about the NHS is that there is a massive permanent campaign being waged by the media, by professional organizations, and so on, about why the NHS is brilliant and needs more money. And indeed, most people support it. If you look at the polling, it's absolutely clear people agree with that. So that I think the problem lies that politicians at the national level haven't got enough power or authority to intervene to make the case that you have to spend money on other things or, in the end, you'll end up you know, with uh, hospitals and no roads to get anybody to them, to put it at its most bleak. Um, no ambulances, indeed, or certainly no fire brigade, and so on. So, you know, I think that's the... Um, so I, I can't really offer any... Um, the only hope I can actually offer is that 
inside government, and if you talk, look at you know, commentators about public sector, I think there's a realization, as particularly from that chart that I showed you about the employment figures, that you can't go on cutting the same parts of the public sector forever. Because eventually, I mean, much sooner than there be no defense, there will be no street cleaning. I mean, you know, street sweeping, uh, refuse collection, there's been a lot of debate about this, um, su not surprisingly, but that service would go early on compared with the NHS. Now, I'm not sure people would really like that. And I said, what I said earlier, people judge most of the public services by what they see out their front door, outside their front door. So, you know, I think that in the end, national politicians of all parties will either need, as I said on one of these slides, either they're going to have to put up taxes or they are going to have to tell the public you're going to have a smaller public sector. And I'm afraid they should, the politicians of all parties at the national level show no sign of doing any of it. Sorry, politicians, but you're local politicians, so I can be rude to national politicians with local politicians in the room, I think. Okay. Any, any more questions? Testing, testing. Um, yeah, thanks. The, um, with the fairer funding, yeah. um, I think it's more the government hopes that the, the counties nick a bit from the districts and boroughs to try and help them out and redistribute as much as north-south. So as a unitary, probably that's going to be as... ...gain or lose. What do you think on that? I think, I think there is a perception that the districts... Um, I mean, within the county and district... Where, where there are counties and districts, there's no doubt the counties think the districts are relatively well off, and certainly in terms of reserves they are. And it may well be that that's where the major redistribution takes place, because actually if you look across the country, some of the biggest reductions in spending since uh, 2010 have been in urban areas, um, because they, in the early years, they had the biggest grants which were cut most. So. Um, I think the idea of saying to, let's choose somewhere nowhere to do with the southeast. So saying you know, to Newcastle upon Tyne, which has had quite big cuts, um, well, you need to have some more cuts in order to redistribute money to counties in the south of England. Doesn't sound like the Mrs. May we've come to know and love. You know, the Mrs. May we've come to know and expect. So, <coughs> so I think. Probably, I mean, it's hard to so some redistribution from counties to districts, possibly, but of course, from the local taxpayers' point of view, that will just be no change at all. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, we shall move on. So, first of all, can I ask you to thank Tony, who's uh, come down today? I know Tony's got to do a radio interview shortly, so um, we're going to let him go, and we're going to move on to our next item, which is Simon New. <laughs> Larger than life, it's Simon New. <laughs> um, again, I pro can you hear me if I just talk without that? Because I don't.
Yeah, we've got um, all of those is elected we won't do anything for
informally on the Corps plan, but certainly to try and start to... Great, thank you, Simon. Any immediate questions for Simon? From anyone? No. I think what I want to do, just because of time, I'm going to ask Ali if, uh, Ali, would you go straight into your item on the people plan and then we'll wrap up with questions from anyone at the end, uh, including a debate about what, what more we want from the leadership network. So, Alan, can you, sorry to disrupt the slides. Um, and that, that we together can communicate um, in terms of what we're doing. So in terms of these are our five work streams, um, which we've talked about before, and just some things we're doing in wellbeing at the moment. I think everybody probably knows we've done our wellbeing survey recently, um, and we're starting to deliver some things that came out of the survey, so things that have happened recently. We've uh, launched our volunteering policy, um, so that's out there in the organisation. I don't know if any teams in the room are taking advantage of that at the moment, but we're really encouraging teams to think about how they can use that for team building events, but also encouraging individuals to take up opportunities for volunteering. Um, also, just up there, we've um, commissioned some pensions workshops, and this was something that was quite a surprising result from the wellbeing survey and came out as one of our, you know, the top things our workforce wanted. So we've got some pensions awareness sessions starting on the 31st of July, and they have already been completely oversubscribed, so they were obviously uh, well wanted. So we're commissioning some more of them. In terms of um, the Good Place to Work work stream, we're working really closely with Angela's team. Um, to try and fix some of the stuff around our physical working environment. Um, and there's a whole host of stuff that's, that's going to be happening around that that we're going to be communicating out soon. And I think people are aware our behaviour framework is now out there and is used in our PDP conversations. So across the organisations, people have got a much greater structure <coughs> to talk about how we work in the organisation as, well as, as well as what we deliver. Um, People know, I, th I think that we're working with a uh, group of people across the leadership network to develop a leadership development program. So we had a really good away day a couple of weeks ago with uh, seven people from our leadership network. Um, and we've heard, it was interesting what Tony said about the one key difference of organisations that are really tackling some of the issues we need to tackle is leadership. Um, so at the next network meeting, we will have an update on our forthcoming leadership development program. Uh, we're doing, I think people know we're doing the Global HPO Review, so in the autumn we're going to be working with you on the results from the Global HPO Review and thinking about how we improve the experience of um, staff within the organisation, particularly um, staff, be our BME staff. Um, and at the moment, we're introducing some things that we, uh, you know, around in inclusivity that, that we know we can fix. So we've introduced some new and different methods of recruitment that people can use. And I think probably most DMTs have had presentations around that. So managers can now choose to use CVs or choose to use branching questions, which tackles some of the barriers that we know exist in terms of our um, appointment process. 
Um, and quite a big thing that is being launched on the 10th of September is our benefits portal. So this is a portal which will provide discounts to staff um, for lots of high street shops, Tesco, Sainsbury's, that type of thing, but also um, local businesses. So it will be like a one-stop portal uh, which, which will provide lots of benefits to staff. So one of the key risks we know we've got with our people promise is about how we communicate to staff across the organisation, so particularly staff that don't regularly use the WAVE. Um, and what we're going to be doing in the autumn is, uh, right across the HR team, we're going to engage everyone in HR to visit every single workplace across the organisation to uh, talk about the people promise to talk about the benefits package that we're rolling out. Um, but what we, we need to do is work together as leaders to um, demonstrate how we're keeping our promise to our people. So that was a bit of a whiz through and I will circulate some slides that you can go through in your team meetings and so on. It's just to really emphasise that um, a lot of work, a hell of a lot of work's gone into this and um, I don't think we've ever had anything like this level of activity which will support our staff and it is absolutely incumbent on people in this room, it's not really an ask, it's a demand that leaders in the organisation get this stuff out to our people so that they can benefit from it. Um, you know, things like the benefits package, that, that's worth up to a grand to a family of four or, or just under that. And, but you know, that's, that's a big, big deal in an environment where we can't chuck pay rises around. So just those sort of things we should really be going out to our staff. And obviously a lot of you have only ever had bad messages to give to staff about cuts and service redesigns and all the rest of this. So what we're hoping is you really seize on this and, um, uh, and get it out there. I did, well I did have one which we think about which is around, which is in your domain around political awareness because I think, I, I don't know, not all, not all managers are working at the top 100 level, not all of them are working as politicians day to day and it's quite easy to get it wrong. So I, that was one of the things I felt we might want to do something yeah, about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think the, um, especially three-way split. Yeah. Sometimes, having worked all my life, you, you were always, we were always, always working to a board of directors. Yeah. You never quite knew what the board of directors were going to decide. Yeah. So you could work at your day job and then have a board of directors meeting, and suddenly it changes. Yeah. So you can. It's the same with committees. Yeah. You can be working for. You'll, you say you're planning. So it's like property. Like, oh, property. Okay, that's. Uh, you could be going to the sale of a property. So yeah. it's, it would never happen, surely, Tony. I'm working then. Oh, of course, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Come and give us our... And, um, or you could be working on a plan for... I'm going to say council tax reduction. I know it's not you, but you know what it means. Yeah, yeah. It's not and, um, but then you go to committee and I said, I don't like that. Yeah. So you've just spent five months somewhere and you know, five councillors who don't really know the ins and outs of what you're doing and the, day, you know, the interests. No, just no, we don't like that. And then it's a two-minute decision in a committee, and then you move on to the next item. And yeah. So you then skulk out thinking, well, what's the point of that? Yeah. So that's that's part of the promise, is not just making the wrap round of the job, but actually making the job more meaningful, yeah. to let politicians know in advance. I, mean, I think I've tried to help with that in the last year and a half, but to know what the politicians are likely to do means that if they're not likely to do something, don't work on it. Yeah. That's the, yeah. it's it so destroying to have... It is difficult, sometimes, I mean, like, I can't say it's and that's going to be a four-month leading for something that may not happen. Yeah. Unless we get early messages around what 
That's right, they can't, they can't fathom what we're Most of the people around here have either seen briefings, I'd say at least 50% of the people. Yeah, you should, you should, should see a fair yeah. number, they're all the senior so managers. They, you know, they've seen me, good or bad, in action, and so they, they pick up a vibe, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. when you change half the council... I know. Mm. And that's, I, I think that the other interesting question is, what's well, so not withstanding political group and so on, so whatever that is, does it go here in terms of political leadership? Because I think you can't. I know sometimes people might think the council's only one small bit of the equation of what the city is, but it's still the expression of the political leadership of the city. And it, it's just if that really struggles, I think the place will struggle because historically that's what you can sort of fathom from places where they've lost their way. So you've got those two strands, you've got to do the normal management stuff, yeah. which is the people promising, yeah. and promising the fair.
from every table then on what, what dominated your discussion. Um, and uh, if, if we can just, if you can just make a note, if one person can just make a note to feedback to Alan. But um, let's go with this table then. What was the what was the biggest topic you wanted? So we talked about uh, it was wonderful to hear a lot of messages, but to be doing something. But we're a really good brain or, or group of brains in this room, and wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use that to, to start making a difference and having challenges, maybe four different challenges in the room of things that we're all really worried about because we all have different links, so whether it's housing, social care, whatever. But actually using this group, yes, to have some of those messages so we can understand what's going on corporately but also to work together to solve these problems. Excellent. Let's pick a table at the back. Rob, your turn. Um, we were talking about what goes on here being has to be linked to what's going on in the real world. So we talk about all the really positive stuff here and then we go away and have to make huge savings. And actually, how, does those, how do those two link together? So it was about making this much more closely linked to the real world that we're living outside this room. Okay, great. Table in the middle. Martin, Dave, Nick. Say that again. Um, we were talking about, in the same way that Anna was, about using the wider group for the different projects that are going on to make sure we use all of the capacity that we've got, because you're right, we are really struggling with that, but if you use a wider group, we should be able to solve some of the problems. Okay. Graham, do you want to talk about our, just one here quickly? Um, we were talking about the um, political context of our roles and a, a real understanding of the relationship between us and councillors and that dynamic and getting it right. So, so, so the pressure that there is on councillors to make decisions, but also the counterpoint of, of not actually frustrating ourselves with doing work that then comes to no fruition. How we get that relationship right, so we get the understanding. So, so what we do is purposeful. Great. This table over here. Um, yeah, we were talking about um, speakers. Interesting to hear from Tony, but uh, maybe from some other inspirational speakers around, uh, you know, the, more at the service level, things they've, they've done, innovations, change that they've actually delivered that's created change, perhaps in social care, something like that. be really interesting. Uh, I came up with a harebrained idea that um, I think Alan could... Uh, <laughs> could help us with maybe we had a social media event you know a bit like an emergency planning event but we're all on our phones reacting to twitter or facebook or something i don't know it'd be very complex but it might be interesting there's a challenge uh i didn't ask the table right at the back that's it so um a lot of common themes from what people have said already um really like the um the guest speakers, but what was discussed was having the ability to kind of reflect on what that speaker has said on tables and then go in with questions so that, um, yeah, so they get a bit more time to digest and then kind of respond, if you like. There was a lot about what happens here is, is real in terms of what's going on back in the uh, workplace and there was, there was a lot of talk about artific artificial intelligence and how that's going to have an impact and um, kind of theming the session. So there was a discussion here about um, the impact that AI is going to have on transport. And then that kind of went on to what impact is that going to have on public health. And it's having those conversations about those topics that, that kind of gets people thinking about what it means as an organisation as opposed to just one service. That was more than one, sorry. I'll pass this table. Next one from you guys. <coughs> Uh, just three things. Um, good, good to he hear from the leader of the council. Um, there are bits around more discussion around innovation that was used. Um, and just reflecting on the conversation I had this morning is we often twin doing it better and cheaper. Let's just do it cheaper. Okay. <laughs> Last table down here. Okay, just really sharing innovation, building what other people have said, but also to include where people have been brave enough and things have failed and the, and the lessons learnt from that too. Great. Okay. Um, fantastic in terms of getting a quick sort of read out. I think that's given lots for us to think about in terms of um, future topics. 
how we might engage you, uh, appreciating that your time's pressured. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you for giving up your time today and your brains. And um, we've hit the hub just after half past four, so thank you very much for attending and see you again soon. <laughs>